There we go. Okay. Sorry about that. Well, welcome everyone to Portfolio Growth Take 2. My name is Jake Pelley and today is November 21st, 2019. As always, here's your fun disclaimer. This is being recorded. You can always view it <clears throat> at your leisure once I post the replay. As you can tell, I don't have much of a voice left after this week, and this is actually an improvement when it's been since Monday and Tuesday. You can actually hear me this time. So, looking at the overall market today. <laughs> Let's see here. Should be some audio. <laughs> I plan only to do a quick market recap, Donna, so don't worry about it. I plan only to do the fan favorites, looking at the overall market, and I want to talk just briefly about the project that I have been working on, and then I'll wrap for the day. Again, it's not, it's not super painful to talk, it's just there's not much of a voice left here. Looking at the overall indexes, the Dow is down 0.14, the Nasdaq being the real lagger up down 0.31, and the S&P 500 down 0.19. Now, we've had a lot of shakiness in the market due to the China trade deal potentially not getting done this year. Also, a little bit of profit taking, let's be honest. The market's been pretty much on an upward trajectory for the past month after earnings. It's not too unheard of to see a little bit of profit taking going on in the overall market. Now, the real losers today were the Sectors most impacted by the Chinese trade deal falling apart and value stocks. You can see that consumer goods taking a little bit of a hit. Our flight to safety stocks not looking particularly strong today. And utilities also taking a little bit of a hit. Now, banks look to be pretty good today and so does healthcare in energy sector. Now the energy sector did take a little bit of a hit earlier on with the announcement that the Aramco IPO potentially is not going to have that many shares. It's only going to be on certain indices. And so it did kind of hurt oil. Now looking at the EIA petroleum status in our this week, we did see a nice little build up, but not significant enough to kind of draw this market up higher. So keep that in mind. Overall, though, the market looks kind of mixed here with the exception of energy and banking look to be pretty strong. The rest of the market looks kind of wonky. Yes, at t is having a strong day today, but it had a pretty weak, it's had a pretty big down day earlier in this week. Okay, as long as you can hear me, G. Adams. Also, I'm kind of light in my volume. I kind of have to keep the microphone like right in my mouth so you can actually hear me. So... Let's go look at AT&T real quick. There was a report that AT&T was a little bit too higher than it should be, and there was some guidance pulled back on AT&T, and it did dip the stock down. AT&T has had a nice particular rise earlier in the month, late into October is when it broke out. And it is retracing pretty heavily. You can see we did have a nice 5% down day. It did move us back into the sideways range here. So as long as this, three, this 36.50 and this 37 holds, it looks like we're back to this range bound movement in AT&T. Volume did pick back up way higher than average volume on that downward movement. And then the second day on the reversal, we got higher than average volume there. That's a pretty good sign that that range is going to hold for AT&T. So keep that in mind. Though if it does break down, it's a pretty ugly movement back down to that 35, uh, 40. If it does move back down there, I'm going to be adding to my position that I currently have on AT&T. I currently own 100 shares of AT&T for the kids' college account. And it looks like if it does dip down there, I might add to more of it for that stock. So I'm okay with this downward movement in AT&T. It looks like it's moving back to range bound. I would look for a movement above 37.71 for a potential return to 49, or sorry, 39. Next up, Home Depot. Now, Home Depot's earnings were not bad. They weren't horrific earnings. They had good revenue, good uh, 
good EPS. The problem was the guidance in Home Depot. The guidance was cut to 1.8% growth next year, which is below the 2.3% that it had this year. So that is a guidance cut. That's not good for a stock, particularly for a stock that's doing share buybacks. This is not a great setup for a potential long. We are seeing a slowdown in momentum, so it could mean that we are seeing a little bit of pullback potentially form. But if it does break down to 220, you're looking at a movement down to the 212 pretty quickly in Home Depot. If it does recover here, I would keep a watch right there for the 225 for the reversal. But as it is right there, that guidance cut on a narrow banding Bollinger Band and a big break like there, you typically follow to the downside for two to three days. You wait for the recovery for two to three days, and then you look to pull back in. So watch for the recovery to the 225. If it fails to hold that, it might be more downside for Home Depot. And Lowe's is getting hit as well. But unlike Home Depot, if we go look at Lowe's here, They're smart enough to not include that uh, production cut. So you can see Lowe's is kind of holding the range for now. Those two kind of move synthetically with each other. Um, Lowe's is more for home improvement. Home Depot is more for building. And you can see Lowe's is still doing okay here. So that is the outlier in the, in the improvement space and that nice little upward trend here. I would be kind of careful for this gap right here on lows. It does look like it cannot hold above this 118 and the two standard deviation of the Bollinger Band does support a top end of that range. But if it does break out, I look for that 122 for the next movement there. So kind of be careful if you are going to be trading lows here. Good volume, but... It is failing to kind of hold to the upside for now. So keep that in mind. If it does break down too, we're looking at a return potentially down to that 113 for our home improvement builder space. Now, let's go look at these. As you can tell, my voice is already starting to get a little bit shaky. I do feel super bad that I haven't been attending the market recaps. Trust me. I, wanted, I want to do the market recaps as much as I can. But this is what I sound like Monday and Tuesday. So it's kind of hard <laughs> to do them. My voice, this is an improvement, by the way. <laughs> My voice, this is an improvement. So, what is Cyber? I believe Cyber is a security company. Um, I believe it's, yeah. I think we've covered Cyber before. <laughs> yeah, access for today's uh so this is a cybersecurity company. We can look at its products. Not bad. This is the big growing space right now. Cybersecurity, the cloud, and server infrastructure are pretty big right now. So anything that has something to do with those three typically do pretty well. Now, earlier in the year, pretty much all cloud-based Products and bid data took a pretty big hit. You can see Cyber took a big hit. Tilo took a pretty big hit around the same time frame, too. I mean, look at that. In August, TWOL took a pretty big hit. And that's my stomach. Um, and then August. it So the space as a whole took a pretty big hit around that time. Hello Auto Networks took the hit, but it did recover. So we are looking for companies in that space that is recovering, and it does look like Cyber is doing okay here. So it looks like Cyber is recovering. That's pretty good. Um, let's see here. So it did have earnings. Earnings are better than expected. Uh, better than expected. Better than expected. 
Okay, so not bad earnings growth. I am a little bit iffy about anything international right now. So that would be my one concern. This is an Israeli company. I do believe. Yeah. I do think international markets are a little bit frothy. Um, let's see here. P.E. ratio is high, but that's high for the, the sector. Let's see the average sector P.E. ratio. It's, it's a sector that usually has a pretty high P.E. ratios anyhow. Yeah, 52... So PE ratio is okay, I guess, for the sector. Um, let's see here. It makes an income, so that's not bad. Not a great income. No dividend. Short float's a little high. And the average volume is kind of light. But take into account the shares outstanding for that volume. And that's okay-ish. Anything above 250000 is tradable. Understand it's going to be a little bit choppy, so let's go look at the option wise. Um, premiums at 30%, that's not bad. We're currently sitting on the lows of premium implied volatility, so there's that. Um, the range looks like it is improving, so not bad. Not a bad recovery range for, for this stock. You're looking at a recovery right there, a sustained movement above 117.50, and the nice brick and the next price targets I'd look at are right here. So I'd look at the price target at uh, let's see here, T21. And one twenty five would be completion of that range. right there like, that, like right there so I'm looking at those ranges because those are where the big dips were those are where it moved back lower tried to recover and moved back lower so we're keeping a watch for these ranges right here for the recovery to potentially happen good earnings I haven't looked into its guidance and is in a good space to grow. Um, Cyber looks like it could recover that 121. I'd keep a watch for that. And if it breaks out of there, the 125 would be my next price target. If it does break down, I would keep a watch for a breakdown right there at the 116. And then right there, return back down to the 112 for CYBR. Now, optionability. It does have weekly options here. The open interest isn't going to be great, but it's not bad. I mean, 626 for a stock that only has volume of 411 is not bad. That premium is a little thick, too. It's actually not bad premium of 29 days out. Like the 105s. 10 deltas, that's a little high. The 103s, there's some nice premium in this this stock to take advantage of too if you wanted to sell some premium here. It does look like there is some. Um, anything above the 103s though, you're going to get into some pretty wide options there. So keep that in mind. But if you wanted to do like a cash secured put because you like this company, there is premium to do it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, covered call side too. Not bad. I mean, you could sell a 121 and get that $3 of protection on CYBR. And if it goes down to that 115, you would be protected. So not bad. There is premium for protection too for a covered call. So not bad. Not bad option side. Haha. <laughs> I should be in bed resting, but I like trading this much. Also, it sounds worse than it is. It's just it's just inflammation in my vocal cords. It's not like I'm dying or anything like that. It's just just a cold that turned into asthma and 
because of the air quality. And everyone in Fresno has asthma at some point, I guess. And just laryngitis. That's what happens when you have two kids in school, though. Don't worry, though. I'm not going to be trying to do an hour and 30 minute uh, mark portfolio growth today. Well, I want to, but we'll see how it lasts. So Cyber looks not bad. Not bad for Cyber. I like the range up. I like the protection you can get from the options. Um, the downside, we do have a little bit of protection there from the 115s. If it does dip below there, you're looking out for the 112s, and that is going to outpace those option premiums. So keep that in mind. But not bad. Not bad at all for option side. Not bad for trend-wise. We are in a nice recovery upward trend. So just keep that in mind for cyber. Not bad. I like the upward movement. I would be careful of that 121, and I would be careful if it does move back down to that 116. So those are the two areas I would look to maybe look to take some profit. And that 124 would be completion of my range. Next up, SIRI Siri. I believe this is another cyber company. SIRI. Uh, Sirius XM. Wow, this place, this company is still in business. Wow. Oh no, it's still in business. It makes good money. Okay. Pays a dividend. Only a nickel. That's not bad. Not bad on that dividend there. Um, short floats a little bit high. It's almost 16%. PE ratio. It's well within the normal PE ratio for that for that sector. Volume is actually pretty good. Hmm. Sirius XM. Wow. Uh, and still making some earnings, so that's not bad. It pays a penny <laughs> a penny dividend. To be fair, is a it's almost a penny stock, so that's kind of fair. Um, range, not bad range right there. The six seventy eight and the seven dollars are your range to play with right now for that. Um, ATR, you're looking at ten cents a day. Well, it's not that much of an ATR. And implied volatility at twenty three percent. Not going to be too much movement in those options. I mean, right outside out the money, you're pretty much not playing the Sirius XM at all. So you're going to be have to, this stock can move about 10 cents a day. So you're going to have to be buying a lot of the stock to actually get price movement here. Um, the at the money options are pretty much where you're going to actually get some option play here. I mean, look at two, we can get pretty much discount and put it only to four options here. And that's pretty much your option spreads to play with there. Not to particular great there. I mean, it's 65 cents per option contract for think or swim. So, um, and that's pretty much going to be a lot of your premium there. There's no premium to sell here. I wouldn't even sell the covered call here. It does outpace the movement though. Um, trend wise. See here, it's a nice recovery. There's no doubt about that. Nice little upper uh, range, nice selling pressure, and then a return to the range. That's pretty good. That's what you want to see for a stock moving up higher. So that's not bad. I figured there's a dip here somewhere, and there it is right there. So, pretty ugly earnings right there. Seven looks to be a pretty hard area of resistance for it to cross above. Though if it does sustain it, it does look like we could move potentially to 716. Let's check this out on a weekly. It's not bad there. Hmm. How are you looking to play Sirius XM?
Well, since 2010, it's been recovering from nine cents. So if you bought it in 2010, you're looking at like what? A pretty good percentage return. So it's, it has been slowly recovering. Very slowly over time. I wonder what's going on. Let's go look at the news for it. Oh, let's see here. So nothing really good. Hmm. They need like a product that I can really be excited about. Yeah, they have Howard Stern. That's cool. They have a bunch of channels, but... I seriously thought they were out of business, so that's how relevant they are. Oh, they have a lot of good, not a bad cast. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, it looks like it's recovering. I'm not particularly bullish in this sector, though. Um. It does look like it is topping out right at that 7. If that 7 cannot be held, you're looking at a potential movement back down to 630. So, you're looking at like 30 cent moves though. So, that's 3 ATRs to the downside. And potentially 2 ATRs to the upside. So, not bad. I mean, if we just play through ATR ranges, not through price movements. It does look like there is a little bit of wiggle room to play with. And if it does break up higher there, it does have a potential movement of moving it's a monthly right there so you'll have to keep kind of a watch on this range if this range fails though it's a move, pretty sharp moving back down to 672 and then right back down to 644 though it's slowly been moving up here so that's a pretty good deal for series um, my one concern would be one we're looking at the MACD crossing we are seeing downward histogram pressure and we are seeing the Bollinger Bands flatten out. So I would wait for the Bollinger Bands to break. And then that's where I would initiate my trade. I did not see the volume in Bristol Myers Squibb. I'll have to go check that out in a moment. Excuse me. How are you looking to play Siri right now? Is a real question. I'd be really interested to know on your play here. Um, it is compressed range. The compressed range is 688 and, six, and pretty much 70. So it's about a 2 ATR range. Remember, it moves two, ten, uh, 10 cents a day, typically. So you're looking about 2 ATRs. We are right on the 14-day moving average. We are well above the 25 moving, uh, moving average, so that's not too bad. So it's a pretty compressed range there, and if it does break down, you're looking at uh, 674 or a break up to 6 or to 715. There is no real option play here unless you're planning on putting in a lot of contracts too for series. Next up, CP, and then we'll look at Bristol Myers Squibb. And then I'm going to talk about, or try to talk about, something I have been, have been researching pretty heavily for everyone. And then we'll wrap for the day here. Unless there's another stock you'd like me to cover, and then I'll add that to the list, and then we'll wrap there. I. I'm going to try to promise you that my voice should have should be returning by Monday next week. Everything should be back to normal. I do feel bad, though. Like, that I, that I missed my market recaps and I can't be here as much as I want. Trading is not really a job for me. I treat it like a job, but this is something that I thoroughly enjoy every day doing. So, looking at the Canadian Pacific Railway. Again, I'm really worried about international companies. Yeah, I know it's Canadian and it's right in the top of the United States. I get that. I'm kind of cool on emerging markets in um, outside markets in the world. Let's see here. The one reason why I don't like Canadian companies, you know, like, you know, your Canadian pot stocks too, like CGC. You see this right here? 
income and sales, they don't have to report it like they do in a United States company. And that always worries me. Now, you could probably go on Investor Relations and find it. Let's see here. Well, it doesn't look like it's easy to find. Okay, let's see here then. Let's go take a look at the earnings. Here we go. So those are pretty good earnings. Pretty good earnings. Ah, uh, the miss. No, that's pretty good. That's good. Uh, miss and beat. So it looks like most of their earnings are positive. Excuse me. It pays a pretty good dividend at 61 cents. What's the volume on this stock? Let's check the volume here. Volume is pretty light. 13,000 employees. That's a big chunk of employee employment. Um... Institutional ownership, so that's pretty good. That's your hedge funds, mutual funds. Okay. Volume is pretty light there. Compared to shares outstanding, you expect a little bit more volume. It is tradable, but at 253,000 shares per day and an average volume of 421 compared to the 131 million shares that it has, you'd expect at least an average volume of 50, uh, 500,000. So, interesting. That's a little bit light there. Uh, it looks like they're doing some acquisitions, so that's pretty good. That's actually pretty good for acquisitions, so that's something you want to see. Um, let's see here. So grain volume says pretty good, okay. That's not bad. So it is it is acquiring company, so that's a good sign for a company for growth. It means they are acquiring other rails, so that's pretty good. When was that news article though? That was on the twenty first, so that was today. Not bad. Okay. You're looking at support right there at two thirty four. Again, you can see diminished volume on a trend channel. And when you have diminished volume when you're testing area support, that typically tells you that you are finding an area support, typically. Um, volume didn't move about average here. Okay. So we are getting closer to that area of support here. Bollinger Bands are showing us compression in the range, and the histogram, the MACD, is sideways ranged movement, and we are seeing more crossing the moving average. So I'd be careful of that. Uh, it did touch the 231 and bounced up. So that's a good sign if that is an area of support. If it does continue to move higher, I'd watch for that 237 right there. And I'd watch for support right there at 234. So I'd watch those two right there. Um, a breakdown would potentially lead us right back down here. Back down the 228 if it does break down this range. That's 228. Let's type that right there. 228. Right there. And if it does break up, it does have a nice little reason to move back to right there. The 242. So that's the, the price targets I would be watching for in CP. Uh, actual implied volatility is 20%. It is moving up, so that's not too bad. Volatility it is picking up after good earnings. Now, we are showing the United States that rail cart movement is declining, and that's never a good thing for freight. But there, you got to see what this company moves. So if this company is moving grain, and we're seeing a movement in grain Rail cart deliveries, well, that's good for CP. If that's what that company specializes in, in moving, 
and that is moving up. We are seeing that people are buying more and more grain. Well, that's good for CP then. So keep that in mind. Let's see here, option wise. It's such light volume, you're not going to see great options but either, by the way. I mean, right out two strikes out of the money, you're, that's where pretty much we're going to see the last really good movement there. You can see right there. So things I would be concerned about is one, to break down the range, two, light volume. So you might see a lot of wide bid-ass spreads. Uh, this doesn't look too bad. We're only looking at six cents so not too bad for 230 dollars 35 dollars share company um the options are going to be pretty wide though so keep that in mind so that's the ranges i'd look at for cp uh, if it does hit that 234 and it bounces off it pretty heavily here i'd look at for profit taking for that 237 and i'd take percentage of my profit right there and then let some shares ride for the potential movement at the 242 I would keep that 234, maybe even make it to like 233.30. I'd keep that as my uh, right there, as I'd probably keep it my stop loss right around there. You want to kind of avoid the fives and the whole numbers. So 233, 233.50. You want to kind of avoid those as your areas of um, stop loss because. Well, there could be some headhunting there at the whole numbers. That's where traders like to typically set their stops. And someone can push down that stock pretty easily down to those levels and kick you out and then get back in. So I'd kind of keep a watch for that. Uh, I am at 7. I just want to get out with my shirt. You have a nice little chopping out right there at seven. Um, seven does look to be a pretty hard area of resistance for it to cross above. I mean, it's tested it one, two, three, four, five, six, seven times of the past one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So seven of the past nine trading days, it's failed to move above that seven dollar range. So do keep that in mind. And volume has diminished. So that could be telling us we're setting a little bit of point of support. Now you could set your stop loss at like 687 right there. Probably a little bit lower like 684. And keep a watch on that. Because of the last 9 trading days. 1, 2, 3, 4. We've tested that, that level and bounced up higher. So keep that in mind. For Siri. Yeah, that's the one thing I don't like about international companies is they, they report their income and their profitability different than what's standard in the United States. Now, mind you, you can look at their financial reports if they are listed in the United States. That is one of the, the rights that shareholders have in the United States is you can look at a company's books at any time you want. Even if you only own one share of a company, you can look at their books. So you can see how past earnings are. So you can look in there and see how their earnings are accounted for there. But when it comes to like Finviz and sites like that, it's not going to have it listed there. I believe Cron is another one. Um, C R O no, it's C R N. There's another pot stock that's a Canadian pot stock that has kind of the same. Accounting practices. Let's see if we can find it. I'll remember it when it's inconvenient. <clears throat> Ooh, Tiva is a pretty good, uh, not a good example on that. But Tiva is a. I haven't looked at Tiva in a while. This is another Israeli uh, pharmaceutical company. It's, they own a ton of generic drugs, too. <clears throat> but anyhow, getting off subject. Yeah, that's where I'd look at Ray Gun 35, which, by the way, cool picture. Cool picture. Um, Bristol Myers. Right, let's go look at Bristol Myers Squibb, and then we'll look at GC. Is it GC? Uh, let's see. There's Canopy Growth. 
Right, and there's Telleray. T L is Telleray another one? Let's see here. Yeah. Telleray's a little bit different. You can actually you see the sales and incomes there. But the financials are very wonky when it comes to those pot stocks too, so you want to be very careful with those. Tilleray doesn't just have pot socks too, by the way. <laughs> it also has subsidiaries. You can see there. So keep that in mind. See, it has facilities and it has real estate as well. So that's one thing they do have going for themselves. If we go look at CGC though, Let's go like a CGC. So this is what you're looking at. So just keep that in mind. And here's investor relations too. If you want to go look at their financials. It's right there. <laughs> so here's 2020. No, we can't look at 2020. We're looking fiscal fourth year financial statements. <clears throat> so accounting firms right here. And see, you can actually go and look at these. Any stock that's listed in the United States stock exchanges, you can go and look at the hard assets like this. And you can look over year over year here. And you can see cash equivalents in 2018 versus cash equivalents in 2019 has grown. Accounts and receivables. So you can do your own breakdown like that. Just because FinViz doesn't have it doesn't mean it's not available for you to go out and get it. So keep that in mind. If there is like a company that's maybe under the radar and you like to look at its financials and it is listed in the stock exchange, you can just go to the investor relations or you can actually call the company. You can get hard copies delivered to yourself. Though there might be a fee for that. So Bristol Myers Squibb. So they're buying Celgene. Hmm. So it looks like they did buy Celgene. Okay. So it looks like it's going to happen. $74 billion Celgene takeover. Wow. I wonder what three jugs Celgene had. Let's go look it up. products look at that it's on the site so it looks like it's mergers happening <clears throat> so these would be the most notable drugs for Celgene that Bristol Myers Squibb currently took over Thalmanoid and Replazol. Never heard of that one. So interesting. Huge vo Wow, look at that huge volume. That's probably on the date that that acquisition closed right there. Is on the 20th. So BMY. Celgene. Uh, merger. Closing date. Yep, look at that, right there. Expects to close the acquisition on November 20th. Look at that volume. What day did that volume happen? September 20th. So that's when all that trading activity from Selgin went over to Bristol Myers Squibb. So PMY. So that, that makes sense why it had that huge volume. That was the close date of that acquisition. So if you're wondering why it had huge volume on that date, 
That's why right there. That's why I thought Huron was a Canadian stock. That's what I thought. I'd be so careful on these pot stocks. Their accounting is so wonky. It's a really good website, though, by the way. As websites go, this one, this one's actually pretty good. Um, but it has investors. There it is. Quarterly results right there. That's actually not bad. Here we go. So if you ever wanted to do the hard math on a company, this is how you do it right here. Which, by the way, cash equivalents, a lot higher than it was this time last year. Substantially higher. And that's what happens when you get venture capitalist money. Accounts receivable, almost three times higher than it was last year. Uh-huh. Loans, look at this, loans. And there you go, right there. They had 314, this must be in bill, uh, millions of dollars. Now they have 683 in loans. Prepaid expenses. So, look at that inventory. That's a huge inventory buildup. So, liabilities, let's look at liabilities. See here. Derivative liabilities. That's interesting right there. You know what a derivative liability is? That would be options liabilities right there. Options any type of future contracts they currently have on. So they have a big option liability. That's interesting. Huh. Interesting. Legalization is changing. I was just reading that last night. They are potentially changing it in the United States, but it's never fully going to be legalized in the United States. It's just too much of a gateway to prosecution in the United States. It's just too easy to prosecute people on that and have that as the foot in the door to actually open someone to other investigations. They just had that last night. I would look more at the U.S.-based legalization for companies IPOing potentially after that. Now those crons, those tellerays are in a good spot, but their financials look a little bit wonky, so keep that in mind. Thank you on that, Andy. I was, that was the point I was going to get to. So, if you are going to invest in a pot stock because of that legalization change in D.C., I would probably try to find the best of the breed and be very careful in its financials. And um, for that range in Bishop Meyer Squibb, again, that's because of the Celgene er, uh, merger and acquisition. Now, because Celgene is a biotech company, you're going to have to look at any drug that they had in Phase 3 or getting potentially moving from Phase 2 to Phase 3 because now that could potentially help um, Bristol Meyer Squibb. So keep that in mind. You now have to add those phase two and phase three drugs over the BMY. That's one thing about a biotech company. You have to know what drugs are currently in phase two and phase three. Because if a drug gets kicked down from phase three back to phase two, it can take up to three years to get back into phase three. And if a company puts a big percentage of its potential growth in that one drug, it's going to hit the company. So you want to keep that in mind for BMY. Let's see here. Um, though the range to look at right now for BMY is not too bad. I mean, you're looking at right there between 56 and 57 is your potential range. Usually when there's a big merger and acquisition, you want to give the stock a day or two for, to let the, the shares settle. So maybe look into Monday for a potential uh, play on BMY after the settlement of the merger and acquisition. So keep that in mind. Whew. So, last up here for the day. 
I've been reading, I've been reading, and I've been listening to a lot of fun traders. I've been listening to Ray D uh, Dalio. I've been listening to a bunch of other BlackRock investors. I've been listening to Quants. I've been listening to banking investors, and a lot of them have been coming up with the same question. We've now seen the market in an unprecedented growth cycle. This is one of the longest bull markets in history. And during this last 10 years, we've had the rise of index funds and ETFs. And they don't know how they're going to perform in the next market down move. Now, I'm not saying the market down move is going to happen anytime soon. But the question has been thrown out a lot by a lot of investors. Even Robert Kiyosaki, even Andy Tanner, even a lot of the other traders that I follow like Frank Curzio, um, Andrew Horowitz, all of them are talking about what's going to happen with these index funds. So what I've been working on is I went and I trafficked all the 100 most, the 100 top ETFs and ETNs. Let's see if I can actually get word to bring this back up. Oh, might have closed it for me. So, I've been looking at the, the ETFs that have the highest volume and average price associated with that. I've compiled them into a list. This is the top 100 ETFs in the United States that are currently trading through average market volume. You can see here's the actual market volume. Here is the accounts hold and custodianship. And I've been breaking down each one one right now it looks like the biggest synthetic uh, the biggest risk is to iShares and iPath these two make up over a third of all index funds traded in the United States and from there I have been collecting the data on each into each individual highly trafficked ETF and I've been compiling the list of what's their holdings and what's the risk if that were to happen um, so the goal, the end goal is to find the stocks that are traded the most inside of ETFs. And so when we do get this down move, the, to kind of pinpoint the stocks that you kind of want to avoid once we do see some big selling happening in these index funds. So right now I'm just compiling all the lists and I'm compiling all the data together right now. It's pretty intensive, all the stocks that's currently being covered through it. But once it's done... I should have a list of at least the top 10 stocks that are held the most through ETFs and indexed fund accounts. So just keeping a watch on that. Now the goal is also to find out the weighting and the amount shares held and using those shares held in ETFs per the amount of shares outstanding and give you a percentage of how much exposure that stock has to ETFs and index fund liability if it does go down. Because, you know, a lot of these traders are saying, what, what's going to happen if this happens? Well, I don't want to be one of those people that have to ask, what if? I want to be one of those people that, that knows the risk to that. So I'm compiling the data now. That question has been thrown out. I'm looking for the answer right now. Uh, give me about a month of data compiling, and I should have this answer for everyone here on what stocks have the highest beta risk to a potential index fund uh, sell off if we do see it but I'm just compiling a lot of data right now and I should have that for you once the data is compiled so keep that in mind um, if there's like a particular ETF or index fund that I don't have on this list and I, I can share the list for everyone to have it um, just let me know I'm also going to go through the three X funds too which is probably the most that's probably the most risk right there the ETNs so keep that in mind. If you'd like to add to the list, let me know, and I'll add a particular ETF that you would like onto this list. But right now, the list is already 100 stocks. 33 of them of this 100, oh, sorry, 36 of this 100 highly trafficked ETFs is all through BlackRock, by the way. 36 of 100 is all through BlackRock. And then it's through ProShare, uh, then it's through Spiders, and then it's through ProShares. That's the breakdown. So right now, um, just doing some fact finding, but it does look like it does look like BlackRock would probably be the one if we do get a, a 
the eventual bear market that arises eventually. BlackRock is probably the one you're going to, to avoid the most because it's going to be the one that's going to get cash squeezed the most. So that's just the preliminary research for now. Uh, so what I'm saying is that uh, let's see, you're not sure if I'm understanding. Excuse my ignorance. Are you saying that people think that ETFs are safer than stocks? So a lot of investors, they've been pushed into indexed and ETF funds through passive investing. So instead of looking through, like just buying a broad-based S&P 500, they're buying the S&P ETF. They're buying the SPY, the uh, XREs. They're buying those funds and what happens when those funds sell off or what happens when people look to start locking in profit that's funds is it's going to hit the individual equities so say like the ETF of the SPY the biggest holding in the SPY is right here let's see here um, SPY So these are two biggest holdings in the SPY. So these two stocks, because of the, they're the biggest weighting inside of it, are going to see the most downward pressure because of that selling of those broad-based ETFs. As interesting is if you look at the DIA as well, you can see that Microsoft is also the 13th. It's beta weighted at 3.6%. Shares held are over a million. But it's also one of the largest holdings inside of the SPY as well. So you can see that there is some liability in Microsoft, particularly taking a hit if these broad-based ETFs all start taking a hit because of profit-taking. That's what I'm trying to get out. Yeah, I'm also looking at bank funds. But uh, once I do the ETFs, that's when I'll start looking at the um, <coughs> the bank funds as well. The bank funds are not as easy to, to pull apart as like your ETFs. So we're going to see where this data lies and which stock to potentially um, try to avoid. So far, the hypothesis is that um, when this broad-based ETF selling happens, if it does ever happen... Probably the place you want to look for is future and forex for the most liquidity. So un following Nick and what Nick's doing in futures would probably be not a bad idea for trading. Learning how futures work would probably be something you want to uh, you want to open your mind to here in the future. So keep that in mind. Uh, let's look at the VXX real quick for for Jay here and then we'll wrap for the day here so that's what I'm currently working on uh, you can see there's just a lot of data just a lot of data that I have to compile through I mean the S&P 500 SPY these are all the holdings inside of it also something of note I saved this over from yesterday from the research that I have been doing let's see if I can find it I didn't close it so this is the prospectus of the ETF uh, GLD so this is the GLD prospectus. Currently, and I found this the most interesting. Let's see if I can find it. So there is currently right here. As of June 30th, 2019, the custodian held 25 million ounces of gold on behalf of the trust in a vault. 100% which is calculated in the form of London goods delivery gold bars with a market value of $36 billion. So there's currently 25 million ounces of GLD held in a vault. I found that interesting because there's currently 288 million shares outstanding. But if we go and look at Finviz and we go look at the shares outstanding of GLD... Look at that right there. There's no shares floating, no shares outstanding. 
So if you ever wanted to know how many shares are actually available to trade on GLD, it's right here in the prospectus, right there. And through the math of how many shares outstanding and how many gold, how many ounces are in, how many ounces are currently held in stewardship or custodianship, you can actually determine the ratio to gold to shares on GLG just by looking at the prospectus to see if it's, if it's actually pairing right to where it should be. Just something I thought interesting looking at when breaking each one of these down. Which, by the way, GDX and GDL, right, GDX and GLD were the ones, the highest traffic right now when it comes to EDF, ETFs. So I thought that I thought that was interesting to kind of take a look at. Yeah, I, I didn't want to be one of those people, you know, the big short when he he read the prospectus, he read the market the mortgages and he read the the bonds and no one was doing it at the time. And when I have a lot of traders that I respect to asking the question well, I don't know what's going to happen when this sells off. I don't accept that answer. So I'm going to go find that answer for myself. And I'm going to, draw, I'm going to just look at the hard data and draw the conclusions from there. I don't want to be surprised once the market finally happens because of this. So just something you want to think about. Ray Delaney of Bridgewater has been talking about it a lot. A lot, a lot, a lot. And he, go look at the accounts that he currently has. He has a lot of exposure in emerging markets, more than you think. Anyhow, anyhow, my voice is starting to give out here. So looking at the volatility index here. So we're looking at the VXX and we're looking at the VIX. Volatility has come down pretty heavily this week. You can see we hit a new low, 52-week low on the VXX. I haven't looked to see when the, if it has announced a split, but when it comes to the VXX, that's what typically happens. It moves jumps up here because of the stock split and then it just steadily steadily moves lower so by hitting a new 52 week low it does look like it's pretty close to due to be hitting a split here excuse me uh, let's go break this down let's go look a little bit in the last couple days volatility has taken a hit because we are seeing that the global equity market is currently trying to to move higher here it is in the bullish run the global equity markets in the bullish run and I am including a lot of stocks inc included in that is because central banks are on a quantitative easing tear once again and typically when the central banks have the markets back it's not great for volatility overall because they're they're putting it in a synthetic put you see that Japan, Japan, Japan is doing quantitative infinity the Bank of Europe is now doing quantitative infinity. The United States Federal Reserve is currently doing quantitative easing, not quantitative easing right now. So what does that do to volatility? It tries up volatility because so banks are going to prop up the market by buying bonds and pushing people out of bonds into equity. So it's going to drive it lower. Now, Powell did come out on Wednesday and he said that, you can see the market popped up here yesterday before Powell spoke and then it absolutely hammered back down. They don't, they don't want to raise interest rates but, or lower interest rates, but they're going to do so if they need to. So keep that in mind. So it's going to show that the VIX is probably going to kind of continue its downward decline here. You can see the VIX in a pretty ugly wedge lower. Lower high, lower high, lower high. <clears throat> it looks like it's in a descending wedge. So it's not great for volatility here. It's not a, a time to potentially go bullish on volatility if this breaks lower. Now, if the Chinese trade deal does fall apart because of this initiative to support uh, the independence of Hong Kong or its separation between China as a whole as part of the deal that Britain and China made uh, when Britain surrendered it back to China, if that makes the trade delegation grumpy, we could have a delay in that trade deal, and that could potentially push the VIX up higher here. So that's the one outlier that I would keep a watch of for now, is if that trade deal falls apart. So keep that in mind. With that being said, though, as you can hear, my voice is pretty much gone. 
If you've not checked out the University tab in quite some time, there is a wealth of knowledge inside of here. Again, I highly recommend starting to learn, learn futures because that's where once we do get this big downward movement in this market, I'm not saying it's this year or next year, but we are eventually going to see a bearish run. It would probably be good to keep a verse on what, how futures work because that's where a lot of liquidity is going to sit. So I would highly recommend watching what anything Nick does when it comes to future trading. Though, if you are a day trader at heart and you just want to stick to day trading and you want to follow a great day trader, Swalk's day trading class is an excellent class and I highly recommend it. With that being said though, as my voice is fried here, this has been your portfolio growth. I'm Jake Pelly from Australia. Have a good rest of your day everyone and I shall catch you back in the trading room.